In this video, we're going to see an example of writing hash functions. What we're going to want to do first is to write a hash function that will work with any string. So I'll define that hash function here. There's two options for the parameters. So we definitely want to pass a string in, and that will be the string that we're calculating the hash function for. And we could also provide another parameter here for what the size of the hash table is. However, that, that hash table size may change, and there might be other situations where we don't even care about fitting the results we return within some range. So I think it's better just to have the one parameter for the string and then let the user decide if they want to use the modulo function to ensure that the result is within a certain range. So I'll start off with an initial hash value of zero. And if it's an empty string, it's going to be zero, I guess. We could maybe set that to some random value so that if it's an empty string, it won't be zero necessarily, but I don't think that really matters. So here, what we're going to do at first, we have to handle the empty string. So if the length of s is greater than or equal to 1, so this means there's at least one character, then I'm going to say the hash is going to be the hash plus the character at index zero. So keep in mind, character is an integer type. So even though this will be a character like ABC, this result will be the ASCII value of that character. And in fact, let's go ahead and do the same thing. If it's greater than one, actually, to be consistent, let's say if it's greater than zero, and then if it's greater than one, then we're going to do the same thing we did. So now we've added the ASCII values of the first two characters. Now if the length, actually I think this is going to be the exact same thing, so why don't we do that and let's pick one more character, we'll pick the fourth character. Again, if it doesn't exist, then we need to, think, well, first off we need to fix those values here. We need to check to be sure that the string is long enough before we actually get that character. But now we've added the first, second, and fifth characters or at least we've added the ASCII values. There's a couple things that I can do just to make this a little more random. So why don't I multiply the hash by itself, and then I'm going to subtract the length of s, and I'll even say times 2. We'll subtract twice the length. So this way, even if these characters are all the same, we'll still get a different hash value. Now, this is good enough for now, so we'll return our hash value. Okay, so let's run this and see what the result is that we get. And you can see that we get some different values. And a couple of things to notice is that the difference between hello and jello is actually pretty extensive. Now, we would have trouble if these three characters were the same and the length was the same, the hash result would always be the same. So it's always probably a good idea to do a little more than what we're doing here to differentiate individual values. So another good hash function would be if we take the, all the characters and add them up. So in fact, why don't we go ahead and do just that? So I'll call this hash string two, and we'll say for all the characters in S, actually let's get our sum first, and ii will be less than s.length, we'll increment ii, and now we'll add all the characters up. Okay, so now, just to make things a little more interesting, now let's multiply the hash times the length. Actually, even more so than the length, let's just say the, the last letter. So this is the last letter, s dot length minus one is the last letter of, of the character. And so this gives me the length, or this gives me the last character. And then I will, I don't know, let's, let's subtract the square of the length from that. And I think, there we go. So that gives me a nice bit of, if I change anything in the string, this is going to change pretty significantly. 
now. And so let's take a look at these. And so now we'll call, we'll use these same values or these same strings. Only now we'll call hash string two instead of hash string one. And when I run this code, you can see we get these. And you'll notice there's a lot more seeming randomness here than there was before. And of course, if I was actually using these functions as part of a hash table, I would want to modulate this by the size of the hash table. If you remember from a previous video, we have the student record class, and we implemented a hash value. Now, we have a problem here. This hash should not modulate by 10. In fact, I would just recommend we return the student number because the nice part is that's a unique number for each student. If you'll remember, each student gets assigned a unique student number that we keep track of with this static int for next number. We also start this at 1024, so it might be a good idea to say, let's subtract start num, and then we'll add one. So that way this will start at one and go forward. What do we call it? Next num, sorry. And so we don't really need to do this, but since we're returning the actual student number, since those are unique, this gives us a nice way of doing these consecutively. Now, you may think this isn't a good hash function because we're just returning the student number essentially. Well, that's true, but the student number is unique. So if we want to add this to our code, here are some student records. And these are the same ones I think that we had before. I can get their hash values. Let's come down to the end of the code. That function's hash value, right? Yeah. So then we'll, in a loop, so for every student in S, we will print the, the record, and then we'll also print the hash value. Actually, let's go ahead and override hash code. That might be more interesting. We, we called it hash value before. Since I haven't changed the name yet, and we haven't overridden this, what's nice is you can actually see what the default one will be, and then we'll run it again with the one that we created. So here you can see we have this hash code, and it shouldn't be s hash code. That should be student. So that was frightening that they all came up the same. That's not good. Okay, so here we go, and now you can see that the student records all have different hash codes, and that's the one that's built in. But since we've created this class, we want to do hash code here. And when I move override, or we want to overwrite hash code. And when I put the override attribute here, you'll notice that I get an error that it says that there's no parent class method. So I need to change this to hash code. And now I've overridden hash code. And my hashing example here will call the one that I created. And then you can see I get these new values, which as it turns out are all negative. So that is not what I would have expected to happen. So I need to fix this student number minus next num. Ah, because next num has this default of 1024. And so I'm actually, whatever that next is. And so this is actually terrible because that's a static integer, but it changes. So I'm going to call this the starting number. And we'll say that that's equal to So, so now I need to give it a type. It's an int. It's 1024, and then I can use that here. So that's the student starting number. And why isn't it recognizing it there? Ah, I misspelled it. So let me fix that spelling. And now, down here, this should be student no start, and that should give me a valid value. And now you can see the hash code. Again, the hash codes start at one and through 10, but those are all unique. And so then if I wanted to put these in a hash table, all I would need to do is take the result of this, modulo it by the size of the hash table, and that would give me the index. Okay, so this is an overview of hash functions. Hopefully you get some ideas of how to write hash functions and, and how to use them. In this course, we're not going to be focused on actually creating a hash table, but it is just something that you need to be aware of. Hopefully this gives you a good introduction to some of the concepts you'll need to use in order to use hashing effectively.